This week I'm joined by scholar and theologian Kevin Hart to discuss the work and life of Maurice Blanchot. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. If you'd like to support the podcast and just keep everything running as the podcast runs off patronage alone, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Kevin Hart, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. My pleasure. Uh, we are going to be discussing the work of Maurice Blanchot, who is, I was thinking of how to sort of describe Blanchot before we began, and he is one of these philosophers who is written about, but not written about, is how I would describe him. So you often see his name in relation to other people, other people mention him. You might see him primarily alongside Levinas, uh, Georges Bataille, but he's one of the, he's, he's sort of a, he seems to be a philosopher's philosopher. I'm not sure if you'd agree with that, but he's one of these names which gets mentioned by other people. And perhaps we haven't spent so much time with him specifically, which is what we aim to do now for a little, a short amount of time. Um, but before we get started, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what it is you do and, and how you became so interested in Blanchot. Sure. Um, well, uh, I teach at the University of Virginia in the United States. I'm Australian. Uh, and at Virginia, I'm in the Department of Religious Studies, where I teach Christian theology primarily. But I'm also in the Department of English and in the Department of French. So I try to contribute over that, um, that threefold area. I've been here for about ooh, 16, 17 years now. Before that, I taught in Australia. And I encountered Blanchot um, many years ago when I was a school teacher before I moved into the tertiary world, when I was teaching in Geelong at the Geelong College. And in those days, uh, English classes had to have an hour in the library once a week. <laughs> and so once my students were all settled with a book, I looked around the shelves to find something to read myself. And I came across um, a, a collection of essays. Mm -hmm. uh, in the French. And I started to read one by someone I'd never heard of called Maurice Blanchot. Um, and it was just entrancing. <laughs> I'd never read anything like it. I'd never read anything with su in such a haunting prose, um, at once informed by philosophy and also uh, um, like a drumbeat of, uh, of strange ideas. So I took the book home and continued to read it over the following days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then slowly over time, those are those are always, I always find those are the philosophers that you end up having a sort of love with, the ones that you stumble across. Yeah, I certainly stumbled across him. And of course, you know, if he's a philosopher, it's not in the usual way in the English speaking world, we, we think of philosophy. He's very far removed from, say, analytic philosophy. And he's pretty far removed even from a lot of European philosophy. Mm. Um, he certainly has a, a very wide philosophical culture. Mm. He's read a lot of philosophy, but he, in, he inscribes philosophical questions in literature and mm. politics, particularly literature. Mm -hmm. Dare I say that's the superior way of talking about philosophy? It's via literature. Yeah, he's um, he adds something new to the mix. He's inherited a lot from um, phenomenology, especially Husserl and Heidegger. Um, but he he puts the phenomenology that he's learned to new uses, particularly with respect to a phenomenology of literature of an unusual kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. Before we get into these ideas of uh, Blanchot, of course, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen to the conversation. Uh, Maurice Blanchot is already sat there waiting for these three to enter. Who do you pick? Okay. This is an interesting question. Um, and I'll probably give a kind of answer that other people who read and admire Blanchot won't give. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, Francis de Salle. The second one is pseudo delicious the Areopagite. And the third one is Jacques Derrida. Ah, okay. Well, you're in luck because I've been reading pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite recently. And along with Derrida and de Salle and with Blanchot, I do see a faint thread there. Perhaps it's of your own interests of what I guess in theo theological terms would be called via negativa, of this inability to ever define what it is we are on about. And I guess with Blanchot, we would have 
Levinas is there is this trembling naming of nothingness of being of whatever being is and then with pseudo Dionysius he says look even we can't even refer to God as God that is how little we know of him is that the thread there right. this inability yeah, yeah. to that's pretty much it I mean with the pseudo Dionysius he's the um, architect I suppose of apophatic theology uh, sometimes called negative theology where we 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 can't approach God because everything we say about God is going to be um, under criticism. So we have to approach God in the spirit of neither nor. Mm. And this is very much something that Blanchot takes over. Uh, Francis de Sales, in his treatise on the love of God, talks about the two wills of God. That there's the demonstrative will um, of a commandment, and catechism and creed and all of that sort of thing. But there's also the permissive will of God, which is darker, that we have to discern, which is not declared. And this is very much the the, the same way in which Blanchot proceeds with respect to literature. And it would be lovely to have Jacques Derrida in the mix, because he was a, a friend of Blanchot's mm -hmm. and someone who tried to develop some of Blanchot's ideas. Mm. Was Blanchot a believer? No, Blanchot is possibly the most consequent atheist who was living uh, while well, the time he was living. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very peculiar... So, you, you know, one of the, as you know, one of the primary texts I read for preparation for this is... I um, just need to get his name correct. Uh, Bident? Bident's biography. It's not Bidon. Bidon. Uh, Maurice Blanchot, a critical biography. And it's really interesting to read this time frame that we're in because there's there's multiple moments where you have, you know, Blanchot and Bataille, you know, Bataille with his uh, extremely... I don't know how to describe his philosophy. Perhaps I, th these words shouldn't be on a podcast. His philosophy of eroticism. And then you have Blanchot with his sort of atheism, as you mentioned. But you also have them surrounded by priests, you know, meetings of these, this peculiar time period of philosophy where there's very much a serious a seriousness around the philosophy of, of what it is now to believe, perhaps in a post-Nietzschean epoch. Yes, very much so. Uh, Bataille, for a very short period, was in training to become a priest. Uh, I can't really imagine Bataille as a priest. He would have been a very... <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to go to a mass celebrated by Georges Bataille. <laughs> Blanchot, at the age of seven or eight, had something like a vision of, of the absence of God, mm. of the non-existence of God. And he remained true to that throughout his life. He was a very consequent atheist of a kind I hadn't encountered before uh, when I first read him. So by consequent atheist, would you... Would you... Oh, absolutely thoroughgoing. Okay. okay. I mean, he allows absolutely no skerrick of sunlight in his world. How do, you have a, how do you have a vision of an absence? Very interesting idea. I mean, uh, since we've touched on apophatic theology already, I mean, theology, when it becomes sophisticated, doesn't think of God as some kind of super being, some kind of cosmic vending machine that just um, delivers answers to prayers. Um, God is... Um, beyond our conceptions. Mm. And so even the most orthodox theologians say that God's mode of being is very different from our own mode of being. Mm. And it becomes, um, in some negative theologies, a hair's breadth between saying that God exists and God does not exist. He certainly doesn't exist as you and I do. No, no. But Blanchot's understanding wouldn't, wouldn't, this is almost a, Strange third path in a way, so it doesn't become a theology of the Bataille kind of, you know, you mentioned there Bataille's um, in training to become a Dominican, and it's interesting reading his own, well, the the biography by uh, Michel Serka, um, yeah. where Bataille is sort of uh, almost trying to force out this mysticism or this feeling that he really wants from God, and it doesn't really ever appear for him, and he sort of right. then inverts this as an atheology, whereas for Blanchot, this vision is just an acceptance it doesn't turn into some other form of, the you know, atheology like Bataille. Right. Bataille, particularly in the period when he and Blanchot were, were close friends, was very drawn to the idea of the limit experience. Mm. And he thought that by yoga, 
by alcohol, by drugs, by looking at photographs of a man being tortured, one could push oneself up to and even a little bit beyond the limit of being human and make contact while alive with death. Mm. This is what he calls la communication. Um, so we're trying to communicate with death in a kind of a Rambodian um, uh, disassociation of all the senses. Mm-hmm. Whereas Longchamp, when he when he talks about limit experience, he's not trying to do anything like that himself. He's not trying to leap into the abyss. He's concerned with the way in which writing uh, draws us into an image which is infinite and where we we can't gain dialectical meaning inside the image and that takes us into the world of dying mm. now this is this is i guess in a way where we really need to begin because it's something that is emphatically um placed within the biography which i read um about blanchot's life is this constant um we could say having death be- before blanchot suffering death illness is quite literally it's not this addition for Blanchot, it's quite literally firmly a part of his existence is physical suffering and an acknowledgement all the time of death as a reality. And yet he lives he lives an extremely long life as well. You're, you're perfectly correct. I mean, if you if you read uh, Christophe Bidon's life of Blanchot, then you'd have seen that when he was a teenager, he, he felt very sick and had to have an operation on his blood of a rather mysterious kind. I've never quite worked out what actually he uh, had to undergo. But he thought that he was um, going under that stage. Mm. And then in his ni- in, the, in his 30s, during the Second World War, he was almost executed by, um, by the Vlasov army, and he survived that. And thereafter, he nearly died in his mid-60s. Mm. So he had many close brushes with death. Um, I'm not sure that those events were what made him focus upon dying and death. That seems to have been apparent to him very early on. It's rare to find a single page by Blanchot which doesn't have the word dying or death, or the two of them together. That's his dualism that he works with all the time. What do you? Th- I mean, perhaps it's quite an asinine question, but what do you think is more important for him, dying or death? Okay, well, this is an interesting thing. For him, dying is associated with life and, as it were, the right approach to life. That puts it way too crudely. When we think of of death concluding something, it makes a whole, it makes a totality. And Blanchot is not attuned to that way of thinking. So he's not like Hegel, for whom death is part of the dialectic because the dialectic is giving meaning. Rather, he's attuned to that kind of intransitive writing, the kind of writing we associate with Samuel Beckett or Franz Kafka, that is perpetually talking. Remember the end of Beckett's great trilogy, where the the speaker um, says, um, I can't go on, I must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on. (laughs) And you almost feel, as you read this, please don't, please don't keep going on. (laughs) Let's have this end. But that kind of perpetual narrative voice that keeps murmuring on and on is for Blanchot the the triumph of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, to draw in another Beckett there, so perhaps for Blanchot, my favorite Beckett line, you know, every, I think it's every utterance is a stain on silence. Right. So perhaps right. for Blanchot, when we finally get a a terminal silence, that's when that is death. But we never we never really get death because the com- this completion is false, and we we'll never we're not part of the the completion. Or is there no completion? Oh, the, the, I mean, there's, there's a biological completion. One one day the body just falls apart, but there's no completion um, in terms of our experience of it. We approach death. But the closer we get to death, we still don't experience it. All we experience is the passivity of dying. Is this a pessimistic thing for Blanchot? Well, I mean, you wouldn't put Maurice Blanchot up um, uh, on stage to tell jokes. There's only only a couple of jokes in the whole of Blanchot's work, and they're pretty dark. Mm 
I think my favorite one is in La Red de Mour, where um, he's talking about the sister of the main character, Jay, and he says, she, in English, um, she liked to live, she said, off the kindness of gentlemen. I assume she's dead. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> he has a he has a dark humor. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 you know, I wrote this question before, you know, before we started recording, I sent these to you. And now it seems like such a peculiar question. I mean, what do we do with death then? Is, it, is, is death really the, as you said, there's not, the, not two pages go by where dying or death, the words and the terms right. and the ideas aren't there. Would you say if there is a kernel, which Blanchot's philosophy, literary philosophy is revolving around, it is this understanding of death. What are we to do with it? Well, one thing he says that we're not to do with it is we're not try, we're not to try to master death. Death cannot be mastered. So, um, when you think of the period in which he was writing, uh, and the um, the prestige of Albert Camus, for example, Camus talks about suicide as being the only true valid philosophical question. But Blanchot thinks that suicide is a complete misdirection; mm -hmm. that you can't master death at all. And he thinks. He thinks in a, a rather somber way about how awful it would be if at the moment of death you had an improper thought, that you, you, know, you, were, you were remembering um, that you haven't paid your laundry bill or something like that, mm. that everything must um, be done in the proper manner. So death for him is the end of everything, obviously, but it is also a kind of strange immortality because once you've died, you can't die again. Mm. So, you know, um, when you're writing, when you finish a work, in a sense, you're, the, the, the work kicks you off the page. Mm -hmm. you, you are, as it were, dead. The death of the author, which was Blanchot's notion before it was taken up in, in by later French thinkers. And there's a sense in which whenever anyone reads anything you've written, mm -hmm. There's a kind of spectral, ghostly resurrection of that self. And that he finds is horrifying. So in a sense, a writer never truly dies. For most of us, this is seen as a good thing, because you write in order to be remembered by people who have some kind of literary immortality. But for Blanchot, this is an illusion and a rather horrible one, because writing always allows your spirit still to come back in a shadowy way. So death is never full and final. Could there be a perfect or pure way of writing, a pure Blanchotian way of writing where you, it's anonymous and no one, no one ever reads it, perhaps? <laughs> Um, well, he did his best in some ways because he was very hermetic for most of his life. Um when he was alive for most of his life until he was in his late 80s, there was no known photograph of him. And it was only when a book on Levinas came out, which had a photograph of the young Blanchot with the young Levinas, that we saw what he looked like as a young man. And then the French journal Lier sent a photographer to hide in the bushes near the <laughs> supermarket where Blanchot and his sister would go to get their groceries, mm. the local kafu, and took a photograph of him and published it in the magazine. And from memory, a very uh, gaunt, sort of skeleton-like, quite, quite ghostly figure. <laughs> Yes, I, I remember many years ago Jacques Derrida telling me about picking Blanchot up in his car, and uh, Blanchot got in the car and sat there, and Derrida said he was a perfect L in the car. <laughs> and he put the restrainer on, the, 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 the seatbelt, and it flapped around him. And, he, and Derrida said, I realized at that moment that uh, Maurice had never really had a proper meal in his life. Was that um, was that one of these sort of Schopenhauerian ascetic, you know, Schopenhauer after all his denouncement of something other or the beyond or, you know, his own appreciations of not being able to know the beyond, he ended up in this sort of ascetic ideal or was this simply for Blanchot? You, you know, there wasn't an ideal behind <laughs> this this figure that he'd amounted to physically. 
Yeah, okay. This this is an interesting question. His writings certainly give the sense of him being a 20th century, entirely secular, atheistical ascetic. Mm-hmm. A kind of saint, you know, in a way. And there's been a whole book written on sanctity among French thinkers. So that's how he seems. And when you read him, you gain this impression of someone who is, as you say, very gaunt, very uh, somber, and often ill. Now, after he died, and we've now find we now know a lot more of him, and memoirs have come out, and lots of photographs of him, he always seems happy. <laughs> he's always smiling, and he seems to be with a different girl every, in every photograph. Maybe that's why he's smiling. Maybe that was why he was <laughs> smiling. <laughs> um, so maybe he just wanted to be left alone to get on with his life without being interrupted by the media all the time. Mm. I want to jump jump back to something because I think it's I th- it seems important. So I think you, you you mentioned about this idea of dying properly, of uh, everything I guess in its right place. Here, you don't want to have a, and I certainly don't want to have a, an annoying thought, you know, on my deathbed. And I think here of um, Emil Chiron, the the aphorist, talking about how when he dies, well, when when he died or when he wanted well, how he wanted to die was to be alone in a room, awake, being sort of o- completely overcome with whatever that experience will be. And for Blanchot, what would what would be what would it would it have been to die properly? Okay. Well first of all it would be not to think of death as a negation. He he didn't like the idea of death as being saying no to life. Um so we're not he's not thinking of death dialectically with respect to life. What he's thinking of, and I think what he would have wanted, as it were, as far as anyone wants to die, is to experience the passivity, an increased passivity, as one approaches the limit of life. So it's as though all of one's possibilities flake away mm. at the end of life. They start flaking away very soon. You know, When one's in one's 20s, mm. you've already made decisions as to what kind of life to lead. Um, at a certain stage, it's way too late to become a, an Olympic athlete, even if you had the ability. It's way too late to think about becoming a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it else, whatever else one might want. And so all of these possibilities drain away. Mm-hmm. And Heidegger has this wonderful passage in um, Sein und Zeit, where he imagines the um, Dasein on his deathbed grasping, his last act of life is is grasping the possibility of no longer being. It's a kind of heroic, virile act at the moment of death. And that's exactly what Blanchot did not want, I think. He didn't think you could have a heroic death in that manner. Rather, it was a matter of the passivity of death finally coming and taking you. So to jump back to your room, it's almost like in the secular sense, Blanchet, for, for this understanding of possibilities falling away, life is a is a negation towards something which is, is the final non-negation, the final thing which is. Yes, I mean, he, it's a very strange thing. It's, it's counterintuitive. But for him, the word dying is a kind of perpetual... Um, uh, burden of the value of life. No, he's not pro-death. Um, he's not pro-illness. He, 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 he wants to talk about uh, enjoying life and seeing life as, as special and precious. But unfortunately, he chooses the word dying as the way of, um, of, of talking about it. So it's a big, it's a big, it's a big thing though to alter one's perception, especially in the contemporary West, of seeing die, dying in any light other than the absolute worst, right, worst right. thing that is. Sure, I mean when you think of Socrates, though, for Socrates, the study of philosophy was ultimately the study of how to die. Mm-hmm. It's the study of, of dying, um, and Longchamp, in many ways, is tied to those ancient Greek ways of thinking. He wrote his um, his one graduate treatise, his one graduate dissertation on scepticism, ancient scepticism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So does he move away from philosophy then into literature? What does he see in literature which allows him something more to attend to these ideas? 
I think he approached philosophy and literature simultaneously. And like many other French people, um, he never thought of philosophy as being set apart from literature. I, I remember when I was teaching at the University of Melbourne, in those days, the philosophy department deliberately would set its classes against the times for English lectures so that you couldn't do both philosophy and literature because they thought the two were utterly incompatible. The French have taught us, I think, in many and varied and interesting ways that philosophical questions are already on the verge of being posed in literature, mm. in, in what we would call modernist literature, post-romantic literature, often the question, what is poetry? What is literature? What does poetry do best? What should literature be doing? Are, uh, as it were, coiled inside the literary work, simply waiting for a reader to uncoil the question and start to answer it with respect to that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you say that Blanchot's career as a writer proper begins, begins with literature? It's actually... It, it starts in a twofold way. His writing career, he's a, he's a political commentator mm -hmm. um, in the day. He's a political journalist, mm -hmm. we would say, uh, and a very vigorous one on the right of politics in those mm -hmm. days, on the far right of politics for a while. But at night, he starts to write um, stories and a novel. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about the, this division in his life of his daytime work and his nighttime work. One wonders if he actually ever slept. Mm. This, this, the politics, the politics sort of, you know, I didn't know too much about Blanchot's biography going into this discussion. So reading mm. this biography, the politics, I sort of had to flip, flip back because of his position amongst, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, a friend of Derrida, a friend of Georges mm. Bataille, and then all of a sudden it mentions that he's a, a far right monarchist. You know, what is this politics doing amidst this? Uh, this style of philosophy, these philo philosophical thoughts. What is something so sort of hardline doing here? It's not. It's not something you see very often. No, although it was not uncommon in the France of the day when he was a young man. He, like many another young man, was on on the far right, and as you say, a monarchist, which is saying something in France. I can tell you, um, and he was a very articulate forceful, um, astringent writer in the cause of the right and indeed the far right. And I think it was only when the war came and he was involved in the resistance in the Marquis that his politics started to change. And after he was almost executed by the, the Vlasov army and escaped for several days and then came back and saw that they had re um, uh, retaliated by killing the sons of some local farmers, that his politics moved from the far right to the far left. Hmm. And that was not uncommon in the day. Interestingly, that wasn't the end of the story. When the far left started to move against Israel mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1960s uh, to support Palestine, he broke with the far left. Hmm. And he said he could never he could never say a word that would endanger Israel. He was very close to Levinas, as you know, mm -hmm. and, and Levinas was very, um, uh, very moved by this affirmation. He quotes a long letter of Blanchot's that um, he wrote to him at the time. So he moved somewhat off to the, um, off to the side of the far left in his last years. Mm. And this this evolves in a sort of a notion of political refusal, <laughs> right? Um, he. As a, as a member of the far right, he was refusing the weakness of France, as he thought, that French parliamentary democracy was not going to save France. And he became bound up with the idea, which I think we would all find rather strange today, about the purity of French blood and things like this that the right wing has always had an attraction for, which I certainly don't see in Australia. We don't think in those terms, I think, and we don't in the United States either. And in Europe, it's rather gone now too. So he was wanted to refuse parliamentary democracy. And then later in the 
um, 50s, 1958, about the Algerian crisis, he came to refuse the whole of de Gaulle and his approach to to um, uh, resolving French problems. And he moved then you know, to the far left. Later on, as I say, he nuanced his view about the far left. He, he was still engaged in refusal, but he thought one also had to work to get concrete change in society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then eventually there is this line from, from the, from, that was from the biography, all revolutions are spiritual revolutions, which after everything we've said so far, seems extremely peculiar. So what, right. what would a spiritual revolution be? And why is there is, why okay. is there is ultimate failure, I guess? Is, there a, is it a failure of normal politics? Right. This is the, one of the oddities of translating the word spirituel into English, <laughs> okay. where it means something a bit more like intellectual. Mm. It doesn't necessarily mean religious or anything to do with that. Um, so what he has in mind, I think, is that revolutions can't be a matter simply of technique. Um, they can't be a matter of, say, taking over the post postal service, taking over the means of production, just simply that, that there must be ideas involved in, in a revolution. So all revolutions are intellectual, no matter what else they are. Mm -hmm. Did he have a revolutionary vision? Oh, he, he, in some sense, yes. I mean, he's he was an anarchist, if anything. The, clo the closest political position I can think of for him is a kind of shifting anarchism. He wanted to oppose everything. He wanted dissidents. He just didn't want people to join one of the socialist or communist parties in France. He wanted dissidents within those parties, true dissidents who would say neither the left nor the right. And this does seem to overlap with his philosophy because there seems to be a reluctance for him for as, as soon as someone has, as soon as there's any limit, as soon as the human being says, this is what I am, or this is what we should do, any limit, this, this, this is bad. This, this isn't good. Right, right. So, I mean, in, uh, in, a, in a big book of his, um, The Infinite Conversation in English, L'Entretien au Fini, um, he, he, right at the start in a note, he says that what he's concerned with is finding a communism that is always beyond communism. So no party will ever come up with the goods for him. And interestingly for him, it's in the experience of writing that determines his politics. Mm -hmm. So writing, he thinks, this kind of intransitive writing we find in Kafka, in Beckett, in Blanchot himself, leads to a kind of dispersal that everything is called into question and can't be gathered together into a totality. And that becomes the model for him of how community should be. How did he feel about sort of finishing books then and writing a... Did he consider them totalities? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question, because at the end of the day, you send in your manuscript to Gallimard or, <laughs> or, or Edition de Mimoui or whoever it happens to be, and it appears as a book, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I wonder, I've seen one or two of his manuscripts. He obviously took enormous care in revising mm -hmm. each thing. You know, he, he was never an academic. He wasn't a professor. Mm -hmm. He never held any university position. He never had an hour sabbatical or research assistants. He was a kind of literary political journalist who, given the French uh, milieu, he was able to write long reviews, mm -hmm. several thousand words, and then revise them so they would go into books. And so the revision of them was very, very careful with a sense of the whole book. But he, he would say it was never a totality. Mm. So the purpose of writing for him was this continual, was it a critique or was it an opening? Was it finding something new? You know, this, this communism that's always beyond communism, this writing that perhaps is always beyond writing. It always has to be something new. Right. It was always open. It was always, well, after the early 60s, I think he would say it is always a direct, directly offered to the other person and to the community. Um, and it is always 
a kind of tension between meaning, which is dialectical, and a kind of um, a neutral uh, uh, offering, which puts one in tune with dying. <laughs> so this, this this neutrality is a is a big big theme. We even have this idea of the neuter. So how does this put one in 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 relationship with dying? Okay, well, um, the neuter is as as we were talking earlier that which is neither X nor not X. So um, the neuter is neither dialectical. Mm. You know, we're, we're engaged in a dialectic now of question and answer. And so it's not like that. Mm. Um, it's nor is it a matter of fusion, as in in the mystic wanting to fuse with God or the lover to fuse with the beloved. So it's not trying to find any unity at all, but being content with a dispersal of meaning which can't quite ever be gathered together. Are we lying to ourselves if we if we said we've gathered it together, whatever it might be? Ah, well, he thinks, I mean, with regard to writers who are concerned with finding a totality, a perfect wholeness, which is always highly seductive, he thinks this is just conceding oneself to the power and glory of literary fame. <laughs> so the, the philosophical or literary totalities that we see are, ma are, are acts of pride? Acts of pride, uh, mistaken ideas about um, about literary fame after one's death, mm. um, buying in to a culture of of exchange. Like Blossom never accepted a prize in all of his life for his, for any of his works. And in France, unlike Australia and the United States, France is just bursting with literary prizes. Mm. I mean, you sometimes think anyone who can sign his or her name without making a spelling mistake will receive a prize at some stage in France. But it's not like that elsewhere. So in, in, for Blanchot to never to have accepted a prize for any of his books is really a strong statement. So he, he, he refused them? It's not like he, he did? As far as we know, yes, he, he doesn't even talk about them. Mm. Hmm. And this, this notion of not being able to sort of gather... Get, well, you can gather things up, but you'd be doing so incorrectly. This seems to flow through, you know, you, you obviously have this on the literary level, as you've mentioned, but this seems to flow through to the individual and the individual's idea of their self or their, 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 their you know, the notion of being a person. Once, we, once we've grasped onto that, we've sort of planted our flag and we're moving away from something that's more important. That's right. He's very much against the idea of a substantive self, a coherent ego and all the rest of it. Um, so in, in one sense, Descartes is is one of his um, objects of, of attack. Uh, he, he's not in favor of the cogito. He's not in favor of any psychological or psychoanalytic movement which talks about the coherence of the self, about the inner theater of the mind, of emotions and intellect being harmonized and all of this. Rather, there is in what we would call the self or the subject, it's a question which he poses very directly and simply as who. <laughs> so, uh, Proust famously in, um, in his great novel talks about Marcel as a sequence of men, happy men, unhappy men, fighting men, conciliatory men, and so on and so forth. But Blanchot talks in one of his um, narratives about each person being a series of questions. Who? 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 Hmm. Well, we have this foundation here. So now for me, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm the sort of... Uh, uh, annoyed westerner i guess i'm always wondering about ends and conclusions and so we have no god we have no <laughs> we have no self we have no 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 leaning on psychology uh we shouldn't try possess or grab or have a totality everything enters into this neutral and it's always questioning so where are we going is, is there anything which you could he blanchot no. blanchot in sense we could say you should be vectored towards what is where's meaning i guess 
within that well, foundation? He, he thinks we do have a, a responsibility to make um, society better. So he's in favor, obviously, of social justice. And especially in his latter years, he signed many protests and, and, and tried to do what he could do uh, as a writer in order to protest against, say, South African apartheid, the Not In Our Name movement he, he supported. And uh, he supported Salman Rushdie when there was um, a fatwa mm. against him. So we all have a duty to be responsible. We must, as he says, name the possible. We, we should try to improve our lot, or, or rather the lot of other people. So you, you can't escape that. He's not a hermit in that sense. He doesn't opt out of society. But does he think there is a final telos, a final end? No. Everything is to be contested. Mm. The, the contestation is infinite. How can you have this sort of non-totalizing politics? Well, it's an interesting thing. There comes a time, as we all know, when you've got to go into a little room and put a cross in one box or the other. And so you make a decision. But I don't think that Blanchot was ever in favor of joining a political party or urging it. And I'm not sure you would want Blanchot in any political party. <laughs> he took a very active role in the May 1968 mm. um, uh, events. Um, but I think he he probably was as much an irritant to the students and workers on those on that committee than than, than someone who was favourable, um, because he always saw problems in in um, in too in in too much of a determinate action. You know that that couldn't last for long. So sixty eight evaporated. It exploded. And it was a good thing for him. He had um, nothing but admiration for 1968. But you could never encapsulate it as a political program. Mm -hmm. It's only that singular moment. I think I, I, I would assume well, that if it was repeated, he'd probably be against the repetition. He, he may well have been. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, it's a funny question. Then there's no there's no telos. I mean, so what what is to be done? What 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 should men as men and women as beings is there something to be to be doing for Blanchot? Ways to comport ourselves in life, or as soon as we do that, are we entering once again into that sort of too much definition? Well, one thing that he would certainly say, I think, is that we must be open to the strangeness of the other person. Mm. The, the other person always speaks to us from a height, as Levinas says, um, but Blanchot has a, 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 a trip to this. He says that I always speak to the other person from a height as well. <laughs> so it's a, what he calls a double dissymmetry, not a simple asymmetry. Mm -hmm. So those kind of social act, those social interactions are extremely important for him, actually in physical life, in real life, but also in writing mm -hmm. and reading. So there's always this relationship of a double dissymmetry going on. And in this way, one um, affirms the other person mm. in his or her uh, life, and one tries to do what one can for that other person. Okay. So that never changes, apart from the fact that it's never quite the same at any given time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think one could be a Blanchotian? Um, one one great thing about Maurice Blanchot that has perpetually attracted me since I first read him is you can never have one of those you know, useful guides that publishers always want people to write on you know, how to understand Derrida in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Hegel in five minutes. Brutally brief accounts of Hegel. Th things like that. Um, you can't do that with Blanchot. It, um you can't find some way of writing a Blanchotian literary criticism. Mm. There's no way you can boil Blanchot down and explain it to undergraduates so they can get an A on a paper, or for professors so they can get a paper accepted in a journal. Um, it just doesn't do, it doesn't work like that at all. And if you tried to do it, it would just be horrible. It would be so banal. 
What it does do is that it contests one's own critical assumptions. Mm-hmm. What one thinks of doing philosophy, what one thinks of, of literature. And after a while, if you keep reading Blanchot, those ideas become implanted, not particular ideas of Blanchot that you that just that, that are immune from criticism, but rather that contrarian spirit of trying to go beyond. Now, that, that's very useful. Mm. Has that enriched your own life? I think it has. I mean, Blanchot is, is, is one aspect of my life. It's not the whole thing. Mm. But it's certainly true that I don't think one could become entirely complacent having read Blanchot and taken him seriously. Mm-hmm. Is there anything uh, regarding Blanchot's writing or ideas that we've overlooked that you, th- you feel is key that we should add in? Well, you know, Sir Isaiah Berlin disting- distinguishes all writers into two groups, mm. foxes and hedgehogs. The, the hedgehog is like Plato, who's got one big idea, you know, mm. the fox. Um, the fox has got many little ideas, like Aristotle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Dostoevsky is a hedgehog. He's got one big idea. Tolstoy is a fox. He's got many little ideas. This is a charming distinction. And once you start to entertain it, you see it happening absolutely everywhere. Now, Blanchot is definitely a hedgehog. Mm. He's got one or two big ideas, Mm. and he keeps going back to them. He may change his vocabulary every now and again, but he's concerned with this idea of the outside or the neutral, and that pretty much runs through all of his writing. Mm. So when you've talked about one sector of law, so as it were, you've generally talked about the whole thing. (laughs) But that's interesting that, that you'd say that because you, there's like a, a paradox there that you say you couldn't have a introductory guide, quick introductory guide to Blanchot, but at the same right. time, once you've spoken about it, you've spoken about the whole thing. So it's a strange, constant, it is this, but not this. It is this, but not this. Keep, you know, a constant neutralizing. And so you mentioned about how, um, you know, you couldn't have this introductory guide. And it seems to me that Blanchot, perhaps explicitly when writing is... Perhaps he was writing, thinking, "No, no, I can't write it like that because I don't want them to. I don't want the reader to get caught." You know, so right. it's a constant, uh, an explicit questioning of the reader's assumptions. That's right, exactly. Um, you know, sometimes when reading Blanchot, you think that what he's really concerned about is that moment when you pick up a pen and you have a blank sheet of paper before you and you're just holding the pen waiting for the first word to come. Mm. He thinks of all of the things that that, that are going through the author's mind. He is very much an author-centered writer. He's really interested in the act of composition, Mm. the way in which writers keep diaries, for example, really interests him because he thinks a writer needs to be um, linked to the everyday world. And the writing diaries, writing in diaries and writing letters does that. Mm. And then you are free to engage in the actual, in literary writing, which he thinks has got a non-transitive element to it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that makes me think, is is someone such as, you know, Jacques Derrida, where we see Blanchot's influence most most clearly? Uh, Derrida, to be sure, but also Foucault, mm. uh, Deleuze. They, they, none of them could have been himself without Blanchot. Um, Derrida is the one who wrote a lot more mm. on Blanchot. He wrote two books to, um, that I can think of, Parage, and another one, the, um, the what is it in English? The moment of my death, the instant of my death. And he was a great admirer of, of Blanchot. He always took his holidays in the village of Aise on the south coast of France, where Blanchot used to have had a house. And he always may, had a ritual of writing a postcard to Blanchot when he was on his holidays. And they've all been, well, a number of them have been found now and collected. And they always end with avec l'admiration, Jacques. With admiration, Jacques. He, he, he was very strongly um, influenced by many things in Blanchot. Um, first of all, in the critical writing, or as you say, the philosophical writing, 
but then more by the narrative writing of Longshore. And he, he, he was very struck by the power of it and the elusiveness of it. I remember one time many years ago, I was having lunch with Derrida in New York, and, and then far too early, I was thinking of writing a book on Blanchot's narratives. And I announced this to, to, to Derrida over lunch. And he said, but this is impossible. Blanchot has completely reset the meaning of writing and reading. And it will be centuries, centuries before anyone can write on those narratives. Of course, he had already written on those narratives. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, yeah. Hmm. Did did Blanchot in his day have any clear detractors, people who were very perhaps anti Blanchotian? Oh, yes. I mean, if you look at the reviews of his books, some people found them completely intolerably puzzling, mysterious. Some people just found him so somber as to be off putting. Um, and then in his later years, when people discovered his far right commitments when young, people were very antagonistic to him because of those. Um, but he, unlike Heidegger, really made um, clear, decisive statements of repentance mm. for his views and said some of the things he published, even though he didn't have complete control over the press. And of course, in those days as now, one's text can be changed by sub-editors. He still repented clearly and said it was it, it was immoral of him to have continued with certain journals after a certain point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where would you advise people to begin with Blanchot? You know, this is a very good question because um, his writing is, in one sense, very even. In in a sense, you could say it doesn't matter; just plunge in. And to some extent, that's true. Like if you have a favorite author, like Mallarmé or Rimbaud. Baudelaire, Kafka, Proust, um, you might as well start with one of his essays on, on one of those thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't have, you know, if French literature isn't your particular thing, I would suggest starting with his story, if it is a story called La Folie du Jour, um, The Madness of the Day in English, mm -hmm. which is really quite short, maybe about 10 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not, if you don't like that, the chances of you liking anything else by <laughs> in narrative style are pretty slim. Is there, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add about Blanchot? One thing I think people probably should know is if you haven't heard the name Maurice Blanchot before, one reason is he never had any public dimension. Even when he was engaging in politics, he did it as a private person without drawing attention to him. Unlike a lot of other French intellectuals, he never appeared on Apostrophe. Um, he never accepted prizes. He never taught in universities. He never traveled. He didn't go to the United States. He published with Gallimard in Paris. But when he came to be translated into English, he was taken up by niche publishers like Station Hill. Mm -hmm. And that meant... Unlike Derrida, who was published by Columbia and Chicago and, and other big name presses, he never made such an impression. Mm -hmm. And also, as we were talking about earlier, his work resists being appropriated and simplified. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's no movement in that way associated with Blanchot. You find Blanchotians now, alas, and they tend to be a bit like um, Grotonians, I think, people who um, are trying to find some new quasi-religion. And Blosso is a, is a, is a, seems to attract people like that. He isn't very... I, I imagine he's not very marketable. You know, this, this fluxing flop. Oh, no, no. He's not marketable at all. I mean, the, the prose, the French prose is very beautiful, um, but it's difficult. It's very challenging. And the later, more fragmentary works are even more challenging. So he's not someone you can read on the tram. And it takes a long time to, to even to begin to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. and you're but it's worth it, I think. Mm -hmm. And you're currently working on, a, on another book on Blanchet. 
Well, you know, it's, it's done. Um, uh, Maurice Blanchot on Poetry and Narrative comes out in May with Bloomsbury. Um, and maybe in a couple of years, I'll start work on another book. I'd like very much to do that book I'm, I referred to earlier in the conversation with Jacques Derrida. I was wondering, so this one's Poetry and Narrative. Or this isn't the one you referred to? Of- no, no, no. This is just another one that, that came out. Um uh, you know, so I go for some years without writing on Blanchot, and then I feel I want to start again. It, it all just seems equally puzzling, equally mysterious, and it has a, a strong fascination. Mm. And so I can sense even now that I would like to try something which is almost impossible, namely to write a book which is not simply a guide, but a book that dives in to the narrative work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when is this uh, recent this new poetry, or the one on poetry and narrative being released. Yeah, that comes out in May this year, May this, May this year, um, with with Bloomsbury in London. Mm-hmm. Well, if you if you uh, have enjoyed this and you're up for it, I'd love to discuss that book with you. You know, absolutely, yeah. I've enjoyed it very much, and I'm happy to come back and talk about that particular book. That'd be great, Kevin Hart. Thanks very much. My pleasure.